Good morning. Welcome to our worship service here at Ridgecrest United Methodist Church in the high desert of California on this last Sunday in August 2021. I'm the Reverend Wesley Elmore, the pastor here, and I'm grateful that you're joining us either on this live stream or watching it later on today or this week. You can follow along with the posting that's through our Facebook page, or you can also just follow along on the, uh, the TV screen the order of worship. I'm joined today by our tech crew of Amy and Scott. Our musicians are Patrick and David. As our singer, we have Heidi and Rob on flute, Elliot on clarinet, and Ted on guitar. And so it's still smoky and hazy and, and hot here, um, but we are grateful that we are able to come and take this opportunity to pause in our schedules and in our lives for a brief time really in the larger scheme of things just to focus our attention on you and our Lord. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are again. We gather as your people. We gather as your people in this space as a worship team. We gather as your people in, around computer or TV screens in homes or even on the road traveling. And we're thankful that we can be connected this way, but we yearn for a larger connection, and we pray that this worship time brings us in that connection with one another, but more importantly, with you. For you are the God who was, who is, and who is to come, and we are grateful. Amen. Our opening hymn is God Whose Love is Reigning O'er Us.
Today, I began a seven-week sermon series looking at the life of Jacob, and we can find this in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. The story will pick up in chapter 25 and go for several chapters, but there's the lingering hints of Jacob's story all throughout the Bible. Jacob's story is part of the family type stories that we find in Genesis. And as we begin, I want to give some background on that. The family stories in Genesis are, are not really tidy or neat. All is not always well between mom and dad and parents and children, brothers and brothers or sisters and brothers. Family was certainly important back in that time. Having children was important. One, to be the labor force for people who were hunter-gatherers and sometime farmers. In order to support the family, you need lots of hands, and you got that one way through children, the other way through slaves and servants. But even more important about children was is that the family lineage, the identity of a person, was continued because of children. And so to be without children was a tragedy indeed. The family systems were patriarchal and focused back then. But it's amazing as we look at these stories to see how often women would play key and significant roles in the Bible stories. Bible teacher Walter Brueggemann says, the narrative about Jacob portrays Israel's at its earthiest and most scandalous. But also remember, we're reading the story now, knowing how it plays out and ends. But in the real time, in the real life of the persons involved, they didn't know what was going to transpire. They were living it out day by day. And so they had choices to make and decisions to make for good or for ill. And their decisions may or may not have been the ones that we would make. We may wonder and shake our head at some of the actions that they took. But here's the thing. God showed up. Sometimes God appeared in ways we might expect. But in other times, God's involvement pushes the limits of our understanding. Jacob's story is also significant because... It's part of our ancestry faith tree. All of us have a genealogical background. And I suspect that many of us know at least some basic information about our ancestors, going back at least to grandparents or great-great-grandparents. Maybe, if we're fortunate, 200 years of going back. But we don't necessarily know the entire lineage. But even if we don't know that, we have other ways that we can hitch on to means of ancestral identification. We have longer roots, as it will, and while we may not know the specifics, we may know that our particular history here is tied into America, or that our ancestors came from Europe, or Africa, or Asia, or even a particular place in Europe, like England, or Scandinavia, or Germany, or Italy, or Spain. The same is true for faith history. No matter where our ancestors entered into Christianity, there was at one point a confession with Christ that gives claim to the family tree of faith that we can find in the Bible. And especially when we look at the New Testament books of Matthew and Luke and their beginning sections, where they give a genealogical history of Jesus going back to Adam. There we find the bloodlines that are traced for Jesus. We find that his history includes people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And while that's the blood DNA line, our faith line is the DNA of faith that is engrafted into that as well. And so we find that the faith tree 
in our reading now of Genesis follows Jacob instead of Esau. Both were born at the same time, but one, but they came with a word from God about the struggle that they engaged in from conception and through birth and into childhood. So as we hear the first part of this Jacob story, we see the origins of this brotherly rivalry, and it will play out in surprising ways in the future. So picking up in Genesis chapter 25 at verse 19 through verse 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the Aramean, of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it's to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided, and the one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the other, the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first one came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edim. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jacob's the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. And Abraham, you may remember, was promised by God to be the father of a great family, the descendants of whom were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. But Abraham and his wife Sarah had trouble even getting a start and it wasn't until years later that Sarah conceived and gave birth to a son, Isaac. How many years, you ask? Well, Sarah was old and gray and shriveled up. And if you walked past her in the supermarket, supermarket aisle and someone pointed to her and whispered to you, this time next year she's going to be pregnant, you would have laughed, which is exactly what Sarah did when God's messenger told her that very thing. But it was true, and out came her son, named Laughter, or Isaac. Isaac must have inherited the same suspect curse of infertility in his choice of spouse, because when he was older and married, Rebecca, his wife, couldn't get pregnant either. So if you said the problems in Jacob's life started even before he was born, you wouldn't be far off. But anyway, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. So finally, after 19 years of marriage and trying to make a baby, and how grateful was she? Well, it wasn't a pleasant or easy pregnancy, so much so that when Rebecca went to see her obstetrician, she complained, 
if it's going to be this way, why do I live? Or in other words, I'd rather die. But besides prescribing bed wrist and the hint of using an epidural, the old doctor who seemed a lot like God said, by the way, one of the reasons you're having such a rough pregnancy is because you've got two babies inside you. You're going to have twins. And these two fetuses growing in your womb, they're doing right now what they're going to do in life as they grow up. They're going to struggle and contend against each other. But it's not just two boys wrestling. They represent even two nations who will fight against each other. Great, Rebecca muttered under her breath. Thanks a lot, husband Isaac, for your prayer. All I wanted was a sweet little baby to rock to sleep. Now we're going to be dealing with gnarly teens forever. And sure enough, when the birthday came, here came two boys. First out came a red, hairy fella, but close behind with a smooth-skinned brother locked with a death grip on his brother's heel. Esau the first was nicknamed Red, and Jacob the second was named, nicknamed the one who supplants or takes by the heel. Will Willimon analyzes it this way. You know, there's no such thing as a painless birth, particularly if that birth is a gift of God, which this birth is. They were twins, twins, brothers, but who struggled. In preparation for today, I asked some people I know, two twins, about the relationships they had with their other pair. These persons are each, each women, so and their twins also each happen to be identicals, and so sisters. Both of them said they had a close relationship with their twin. And one of them told me that her twin sister once remarked, and her twin sister was married, and her twin sister said, you know, if we were at the edge of a cliff and my husband and my twin sister began slipping off the cliff and falling, I would go grab my twin before my husband. That's how close the relationship is. These twins that I talked to also shared that in all the twins that they knew, the relationships were either extremely close or else they couldn't stand each other. In fact, one of them said they knew a, a twin pair where the twins hadn't spoken to each other in over 20 years. Now Jacob and Esau were obviously fraternal twins and not identical, and that's a key feature that will play out later in life, as we'll see next Sunday. But besides being different in appearance, they were different in hobbies and interests. Esau looks like a lumberjack, and he probably wore Duluth trading underwear. He could easily win a bar brawl. He probably sharpened his hunting knife with his teeth. And Jacob's the one who's curled up in the bedroom. He's obsessed with video games that he plays for hours on end. But he'll come out from time to time and do the chores in the house. And he especially learned to go into the kitchen and learn to cook with the women. We can also surmise they probably were not the best buddies. And so while they were equal on their birth certificates, they certainly were not viewed as equal by one another and nor by their mom and dad. Esau was his dad's manly son, and Jacob was a mama's boy. Now you might protest, all of that doesn't matter, whether you live out in the woods, or whether you're a couch potato, or an interior decorator, or a chef. But you know, it does, because a divided love has consequences. It changes the course of lives and what happens. It even changes history. And such obvious favoritism leads to heart-rending circumstances in which families are divided and resentments may linger and fester for years if not resolved. 
Jacob and Esau. It's not the first time one child has been favored over another in the Bible, and they will not be the last. To make matters even more complex and confusing is when such prejudicial love moves beyond human relationships into the divine ones. God, we cry out to you. And sometimes God responds with, this is the one I love. And God picks one over another. But then again, how is that any different than our families, real families, where a mother shows favor to one child and a dad to the other? Growing up, I was one of four children. There were three boys and one girl. And we had our typical time as kids where we got along and played together, but also had our disagreements. One of the things that all of us boys as adults in talking that we agreed about looking back on growing up with one sister was, was that in our views, back as boys growing up now, was that the sister was the more favored one. And she cunningly used that to her advantage when it suited her. So, in the house where we lived in, she is the only girl, had her only bedroom, separated by a hallway, and one large bedroom for all three of us boys, and we could be playing together. But if we were in our room, and she was in her room, and one of us wanted to, to go over to her to, yes, maybe genuinely play with her, maybe even bother her, we didn't even have to be there, and she could cry out, yelling downstairs, mom or dad, usually mom, because she was at home. She would cry out, Wesley's bothering me. And even if we weren't, the answer would be yelled back up the stairs, Wesley, leave your sister alone. <laughs> we would be reprimanded to go back to our room. We weren't even close to her. And the other thing that our parents rarely saw was the look of triumph on my sister's face at being able to pull it out. Now that was our view as the siblings, and I know my, my parents had a different view, and we can laugh and joke about it now, but I envision the same thing playing out between Esau and Jacob. You know, it is both our human strength and our weakness, this favoritism. And just as it's true in my family, and just like it's true in yours, it's true in Isaac and Rebekah and Esau and Jacob's family. Sometimes that favoritism is ingrained in the cultural tradition, such as the time period of Genesis, like the rights of the firstborn child, and in particular, the rights of boys over girls. The firstborn gets the primary inheritance of the family, if it's a girl who's firstborn, she's got to wait her turn until the firstborn son comes along. It's a long-established and widespread custom in many cultures. And it has its benefits because it provided stability. It resolved issues even before they would be brought up. You didn't have to worry about who got what or who was responsible. It was established. And in the case of twins, who emerges from the womb first gets that claim. So Esau is the designee, at least in the eyes and understanding of Isaac, except for that little problem of prophecy from God that God spoke to Rebekah. The elder shall serve the younger. Jacob's clutch of Esau's heel is a prophetic sign that he's going to pull himself ahead and past his brother. And guess what? He's got his mom on his side and he's got God on his side as well. The larger share of the family inheritance and the benefits are switching from Esau to Jacob as the story plays out. And instead of the older getting the most, it'll be the younger. So we see God throwing a curveball into the expected and anticipated way of things. God has promised this family great blessings, 
of kin and land and divine presence. And God is going to keep those promises, even if it means that the family is going to be kept guessing at times, wondering what it's all about. God's going to keep those promises even when the supposed order of things is subverted. And this is the story of Jacob, a story right from the beginning that is full of struggle and twists and turns. An older brother who's swindled by stew, a younger brother being mentored in the kitchen by mom to cook up devious plots, and two brothers who will have more face-offs in the future. I invite you to stay tuned. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess we don't understand the scope of your intentions. And we confess that sometimes we try to take advantage of our family members and even of you. And yet you still persist in loving us. And that's pretty amazing. So help us, help us be thankful. Amen. I was there to hear your warning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoiced the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child. With the faith to shall suit you well. In a blaze of light you wandered off to find where demons dwell. When you heard the wonder of the word, I was there to cheer you on. You were raised. Praise the living Lord, to whom you now belong. If you find someone to share your time, and you join your hearts as one, I'll be there to make your verses rhyme from dusk till rising sun. In the middle ages of your life, not too old, no longer young, I'll be there to guide you through the night, complete what I've begun. When the gently closes in, and you shut your weary eyes. I'll be there as I have always been, with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you Rejoiced the day you were baptized to see your life unfold.
I invite you to join with me in taking a few moments to, uh, to hear some prayer requests and then to uh, pray for them, not just in these moments, but also to keep them in your prayers in the coming weeks. Even now, as we are doing this worship, uh, Hurricane Ida is coming ashore in Louisiana as a major category storm, and we pray for the people right now who are hunkered down and trying to ride out and to be safe in this storm on this anniversary of Hurricane Katrina 16 years ago. And so for these people, we lift up our prayers. We pray also for those in the West affected by the fires that continue to burn um, uh, greatly and in some places unchecked. And for those persons who are uh, property and their possessions are in the way of those fires, that those might be protected, but also lives as well, and for the firefighters that have been working for weeks on end in many cases. And also here in our community is the, the smoke and the haze from some fires that are distant from us, but continue to affect those with breathing conditions. Likewise, the the continued issue with the COVID-19 pandemic and the rising number of cases. And we also pray for the situation uh, in Afghanistan that continues to unfold, that um, our leaders would uh, make the decisions and moves that would help be the morally right ones and take the steps necessary to um, get the people evacuated that need to be evacuated. We also remember the families of our service men and women who died this past week doing their duty and as they mourn their losses. We lift up to you those who are facing medical procedures or appointments this week um, that will possibly affect some future decisions. Also those that are undergoing rehab and recovery from surgery yeah, in particular, Benita Becker, who is in Seattle, or Spokane area, excuse me, and then also Roxanne, who is, uh, has some upcoming appointments as well. So all of these we give to the Lord in our own way, and I invite you to bow with me in prayer. Almighty God, we pray for the world, pray for the church, we pray for the people that know you as Lord and Savior and the people that do not. We pray for those that are in harm's way, whether that is because of those things we call natural disasters, and whether those people are in harm's way because of the unfortunateness of being in that location, or whether they're in harm's way because their rescuers and protectors and providers, and those that are in harm's way because they volunteered to be in our military to go and to protect those who are vulnerable against those who are evil. We pray for the peoples of this land, its leaders, and pray for Christians worldwide we pray for one another, those who are in pain and hurting. We pray for ourselves that our prayers might fall in line with your will, O oh God. And we trust that when we consistently pray this prayer that you gave us, that you help bring us into your will. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I 
cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet, and any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. We take our offering virtually, and I am grateful for the ways that you give, whether it's dropping it off in person at the church, putting it in the mail, or using the electronic means. Thank you for those that have been food donations for the food pantry and also school supplies for school supplies. So we'll wrap that up at the end of this week, or in this week as we end the month of August. Let us end our time in worship with our closing hymn. Receive the benediction of believing hearts. May the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless you through the companionship of Christ, who is God's only Son, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He came singing love. He lived singing love. silence if the song is to go on we must do the singing if the song is to go on we must do the singing he came singing love he lived singing love he died singing in silence if the song is to go on we must do the singing if the song is to go on we must do the singing <laughs>